Howdy, welcome to another week of Canning Calls. This week, I wanted to introduce my guest and the topic by way of highlighting a book on the Canon shelf that you may not be familiar with. It's called Plowing in Hope Towards a Biblical Theology of Culture by David Hegeman. If salvation is comprehensive, then Jesus is in the process of transforming each culture, not helicoptering believers out. So what does that look like? Christians often view culture as either a worthless distraction from spiritual matters, something like evangelism, prayer, and our relationship with God, or as something that is basically neutral in which Christians can consume unthinkingly. Against all this, David argues that salvation is comprehensive. Salvation does not just include changing one's belief about God, but involves the restoration of human individuals in all of their interests all of their talents, and all of their beliefs. Jesus is in the process of saving Christian culture. Theologically balanced, this book provides a positive, clear, and colorful introduction to this much debated topic. Get Plowing in Hope today at canonpress.com. Now for the guest, who I think betrays and lives out what Plowing in Hope is trying to get at, the kind of person that the book is trying to make you into, and his name is Ty Enkoviak, who manages and runs Tapped Tap House and Kitchen here in Moscow, Idaho, and we talked all things beer and beer distribution and tap houses and marketing and how do you run those, all the while walking me through several different kinds of craft beers and their histories with distribution and how they ended up where they did. All in all, I had a really good time. Please enjoy this episode and meet Ty and Koviak. Ty and Koviak, welcome to Canon Calls, dude. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Ty runs Tapped Tap House and Kitchen in Moscow, Idaho. Right. You're a new St. Andrews grad. Um, so if listeners have been to Moscow, everybody's been tapped. If you haven't, you messed up. <laughs> and then listeners may also know, at least of your family's work, your wife has done awesome stuff for us. She did the cover of Christine Cohen's uh, The Winter King. Very fantastic. Yeah, yeah. She does phenomenal work, and she's got more projects in the work with other publishers as well. So She's awesome. Yeah, 2020 is going to be a big Aunt Kobiak illustration <laughs> year. Heck yeah, man. So... I talked to you a while back. I wanted to have you on. Yeah. So, Ty, as the operator of a tap house, I was like, hey, you should bring some beers. So, what, what did you bring? Uh, so, I brought four different beers, and this was, honestly, I'm meant to be better prepared, but this is what I had in my fridge. The point of the beers that I brought in was to talk a little bit about the way that distribution works and how, how in some ways, that's helped and hampered craft beer. Um, so, I brought in a Guinness as a comparison point, because I think for a lot of people, that's when they th- hear dark beer, oh, like a Guinness. Right, uh, right. Something that I hear more than once a day, probably. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to kind of rep this brewery. It's called Cold Fire. It's out of Eugene, Oregon. This is their bourbon council. It's a bourbon barrel-aged imperial stout. Okay. And so this would be the like far opposite end of the spectrum of what a Guinness is. Okay. Guinness is, you know, light creamy smooth it's uh you'll hear in craft beer the word sessionable 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 it just means that you could drink several of them in a session in a setting as opposed to this this would be like drink drinking a bottle of this would be like drinking a bottle of wine by yourself it would be much more recommendable to share it with somebody (laughs) not sessionable Um, not sessionable (laughs) and then i brought in the avalanche amber ale from breckenridge which is out of colorado okay and the dirty bastard from founders which is out of grand rapids michigan okay because these two would be lumped together in roughly the same style as an amber ale and a scotch ale okay um but they're as far as taste flavor profile they're wildly different they're also an interesting kind of story of distribution between those two beers Perfect. one caveat i want to throw out is that i am not a beer hobbyist Okay. There are beer hunters, beer hobbyists, people who read beer periodicals, people who, when they go on vacation, they plan their route based on the breweries that they want to see. Yep. Um, I don't go on vacation. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not a beer hobbyist. Okay. My, I have a job that 
relies heavily on my interaction with beer. But because of that, my beer knowledge and appreciation is very provincial. Right. That I primarily focus on what is distributed in our area. Because at the end of the day, if I can get it on tap, it's very important to me. Yep. If I can't pass it along to my customers, then it becomes considerably less important to me. So I'm sure that there are people who are going to have more <laughs> broadly thought out opinions on distribution and how craft beer works. Like for instance, I could not tell you a single thing about imports. Okay. Because I couldn't tell you anything about the brewing industry in Europe right now because my focus is on American beer, particularly craft beer in the Northwest. So do we, we want yeah, to define doing first? what first let's have a beer. Yeah. There are things about the job. <laughs> it's there are a, benefits. It's a funny thing. When it rains, it pours. I will. <laughs> so there are brewery reps who travel <laughs> Thank you, around their market that will bring samples because they want you to buy their beer. Yeah. Um, Beer, alcohol sales in the U.S. is a three-tier system. So there's the brewery, there's a distributor, and there's the retailer. Okay. Um, and if you want to call it a four-tier, then it lands at the guest. Breweries, except in within their state or unless they get a distribution license, can't sell directly to retailers. Okay. It has to go through a distributor. Okay. So a brewery rep will come to me and they will say, hey, here are these, you know, Three or four new beers. They're amazing. You'll love them. Your customers will love them. Please buy them from the distributor. <laughs> it's this, for me as an operator, it's really comfortable because at the end of the day, they can't say, and I've got some in my car. Do you want to buy it? Right. It's if I don't like it, I don't have to buy it from them because I can just talk to the distributor. But when it rains, it pours. I'll go like two or three weeks without seeing a brewery rep. And then I will see six in one day. Wow. And they all want me to try four beers. Right. And those are not productive <laughs> days. So are they just cruising around? Like they'll hit like you guys and four others around? Yeah. Like, so they just, that's so, what they do. So often what they'll do is they'll try to schedule events and then plan trips around events. So if we do a tap takeover, which is where right. a regional brewery comes in, they bring a bunch of beers. We try to get as many as we can. So we just did a tap takeover with 24 different beers from the wow. brewery. But they'll plan a tap takeover and then they'll plan a couple days in the market where they'll hit Moscow, Pullman, Clarkson, Lewiston. And just going from bar to bar, right? Yep. Saying, hey, this is the product or I'm trying to schedule an event with other venues. Yep. Uh, for them, their goal is just to make sure that the distributor is repping their product to the retailer. Right. And right. trying to just be on the on the tip of the retailer's mind. Right. Because, again, they can't sell directly to the retailer. So, yeah, there are brewery sales reps have regions. They travel around and they're going to prioritize high impact areas. So if you have northern Idaho, you're going to spend more time in Coeur d'Alene than you do in Moscow. Right. If you have all of Idaho, you're going to spend you're going to be based out of Boise and then you're going to make a trip all the way up every two months or something like that, or maybe even farther apart than that. When you mentioned the tap takeovers, those are weekly. Every other week. Typically. Every other week. Yeah. Okay. Which seems like, I mean, that seems like a great way for you to get to know a brewery and their right. beers and everything else. Uh, do other places do that? It seems like an awesome Lo idea. Lots of places do that. One of the things that makes us a little unique is that we do start working months in advance to bring in as many beers as possible. Okay. You know, our kind of, our shtick is it's the closest thing to go into the brewery without actually going. And so there's some breweries that actually don't like working with us on that front because it's a lot of work to get 20 beers from your home market to kind of an outlying market. Right. Right. Uh, obviously, if it's a Spokane or a Coeur d'Alene brewery or a Boise brewery, relatively easy. But if you are a Seattle brewery or a Grand Rapids, Michigan brewery, it takes a lot of work and coordination, often creating new SKUs, which have to be turned into the ABC to get approval, SKUs being unique items, alcohol yep. board of control. So it's to do an event like ours, most, most tap takeovers that you're going to go to are somewhere between four and six beers. It's going to be, you know, five of their flagship beers and then one specialty. And so we, we work really hard to differentiate ourselves by bringing in as many beers as possible. And it's a lot of work, not just for us, but for the brewery rep as well. So can you, at the outset, differentiate like what, what it's the difference between like a tap house, the, like a general pub or a bar? Can you help yeah, absolutely. differentiate so, those? So a tap house is 
kind of the intention is to be a quality beer establishment with no theme besides beer. Okay. Right. So there are other like quality beer establishments. Like I'd say the predecessor of a tap house might be something like an Irish pub. Okay. Right, where the point is not to go in and and disappear into alcohol. Right. The point is to go in, have an aesthetic experience, actually enjoy a quality product. Right. So at the baseline, a tap house is just a a venue that features a lot of craft beer. Okay. Right. The center, the calling point of the tap house is the tap line. Right. The the lineup of beers that you have. Right. Um, so that you know often, and what we kind of are is a conflation of a tap house. And a gastro pub. Okay. Right, a gastro pub is where you take traditional pub food flavors, food that pairs well with beer, and you bring intentionality to it. Okay. So you're trying to take these right great like salty, fatty, right traditional like bar food kind of flavors and bring some like from scratch intentional creative effort to it. Okay. So rather than you know taking your TGI Friday frozen jalapeno poppers right. and dumping them straight into the fryer, right? Right. You you work at figuring out what makes those flavors correspond well with beer and try to elevate it a little bit. Totally. totally. Yeah, so we ride the line between a gastro pub where we do a lot of really great from scratch food and tap house. We've got 40 taps. And so we kind of walk that balance. I know Dane is grateful just being in his office that you didn't bring up chilies or, you know, any other sort of, you know, restaurant of that nature. That would have been too far. Yep. So TGI Fridays though, we're, you good with that, Dane? Dunking on them. Dunking on TGI Fridays. Oh, yeah. Do it. I, don't know, I don't know why I brought up Fridays because I, the one that I crap on is usually Applebee's. But oh yeah, yeah. Well, Dane's a big fan of Applebee's too. <laughs> I will say that half price appetizers after nine half, at Applebee's yeah, price got apps. me through my freshman year. Dollar margaritas, I think they do that sometimes. Yeah, I did not do that during my freshman year. <laughs> I yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay. And then, so that's the tap house. Yeah. So, uh, cause one reason I ask, I grew up in North Texas and when I turned 21, it really was like craft beer wasn't huge around. I, I don't know if that's true. Craft beer was getting very big. Craft beer distribution, distribution. was still lagging. Okay, there it is. Right, so a tap house can't exist without good distribution. Okay. Right, so in Moscow, Idaho, which despite having a growing craft beer scene, is still very much an outlying market for most breweries, we have access through, there are three main distributors. Odom, which in the last two years bought its uh, prime main competitor, which was Click. Okay. So Odom and Click are now one thing, and then there's Centennial and Hayden okay. distributing. Um, they're bigger wine distributors, but those are the three kind of big beer distributors. There's then probably a dozen other small distributors that represent anywhere from two to ten breweries. Okay. Um, but we easily have two or three hundred breweries oh, wow. distributed just in our region alone. Okay. Which percentage wise is pitiful because in 2020 there are over 8,000 breweries in the wow. U.S. We, uh, I think it's in 2016 or 2017. Please, nobody fact check. <laughs> But there is no fact checking on the podcast. Fabulous. I guess that should be the qualifier. When, <laughs> yeah. I, when I said that, yeah. when I said that my knowledge is provincial, <laughs> yeah. I mean it doesn't extend past my own ears. Yeah, dates um, are not a thing we test on. <laughs> okay, so excellent. But only in the last handful of years did we actually surpass pre-prohibition numbers of breweries in the U.S. Whoa! Because you had, you know, brewing was hyper local. Sure. Right. It's you, you know, your town had a brewery or two and it was connected probably to a tavern, much like the modern day tap house. Yeah. But what they may or rather more like the modern day brew pub where you had small brewing system, you're producing for your local area and every town had that. Right. So pre prohibition, there were well over 5000 breweries in the U.S. Cut that down to essentially zero during prohibition. And it took literally until like 2016 for us to hit that number again. We're in a new explosion where like 3,000 breweries have opened in the last five years. It's Crazy. insane. And even, I guess, culturally is what I mean, too. When I moved, so I went to college in Minneapolis, yeah. which culturally is a big time craft beer, pubs. Um, for example, like if I told a family member, like, hey, my small group in Minneapolis, we actually meet at a pub. And that's a very normal thing. And it's not yeah. at all seen as like a... Um, 
I think when they heard it, they're thinking like the lights are dim. There's like an evil cackle happening right. at the bar and you're just like, I'm sure it's over like a very bad joke, you know? Yeah. It, and it was like, well, it, it was, it was difficult for me to try to give them or talk about the culture and the atmosphere is way different than I think they're thinking. Right. But now when I go back, there's all kinds of craft beer places and pubs and like yeah. now, now it's there where it was like maybe a decade ago. It just wasn't there, but now it's huge. It's everywhere. Yeah. Well, and I think that a decade ago you had to be looking for it. Okay. So, but again, with distribution catching up, it's now able to spread everywhere. Right. Um, you know, I, I grew up maybe as a little bit of an anomaly. My dad was an early adopter in the craft beer thing. He was brewing at home. It's his, you know, places that we like to, to go were brew pubs. So there's yep. one called Ram's Head in the area that I grew up that's still phenomenal to this day. There's one called Duke Claw. We also grew up about an hour and a half away from Dogfish Head, okay. which is one of the godfathers of craft brewing in the U.S. Yeah. And so like consistently Fordham, which was another microbrewery that was in the area. I remember like just in the fridge there being like Fordham, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, something from Dogfish Head. And then maybe like one import, like a like a German lager or Guinness or something. So your like dad's that. the hobbyist, not you. What? Not a yes, yeah. So at the time he definitely was. Okay. But yeah, so I grew up, I grew up with probably a different different idea of what beer is than a lot of people, just because yeah. my dad was a craft beer guy back in the early '90s when it was a lot harder to be a craft beer guy. Right. There was kind of a boom at that time that then fizzled and then kind of had a reigniting right before 2010 um, with the kind of distribution of things like Dogfish Head and Sam Adams. Right. And a lot of those, a lot of those like now, now almost unfashionable breweries that paved the way. It's, I read an article a year or two ago about, that was called Not My Dad's Craft Beer. <laughs> and basically, you know, breweries like Sam Adams that still produce really good quality stuff have just kind of gone by the wayside for a lot of craft beer fans because it is such a progressive, dynamic industry where because craft breweries are not are not committed to the same national obligations that the, what I'll probably charitably call domestic breweries, things like Bud Light and Coors Light, yep. or excuse me, Budweiser and Coors, they don't have the same commitments. They don't have to roll out something across the entire country. Yeah. So they can produce something for their region or produce something that doesn't come out of the pub. And so craft beer moves so quickly. And inevitably, if I see something that like a new unique style that has good marketing, I'll see 10 others of it in a month. Right. Because beer is such a quick turnaround compared to wine and spirits you can produce a new batch of something in a couple of weeks and so often right. it's uh, tough for lagavulin you yeah. know it's <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly <laughs> right well in 16 years yeah. we'll try something yeah, you new you know what yeah. this is going to be great in you know two decades yeah exactly yeah. so craft beer because of it's very dynamic because in general even larger craft breweries right can produce things for their home market or just for the pub um, so GABF, the Great American Beer Festival, happens every year in the fall. And inevitably, within a couple of months, you'll see like a dozen new experimental styles from a bunch of different breweries from all over the country because they all come together and they see, oh, New Belgium is doing this or, oh, Sierra Nevada is doing that, right? Let's see if that works in our market. And so it just, it moves so quick. Where in the four and a half years that we've been open, I've seen 10 new styles come out that either revitalizing an old style or genuinely creating a new style of beverage, it's just, it's a very, very fast moving market. And if you're not keeping up, you're going to get left behind very quickly. Okay. Uh, before I ask another one, we had the Guinness, right? Yeah. The Guinness so, drought. Right. This is a great, typically in tasting beer, wine, anything, you want to go from less intense to more intense. Yep. Um, so Guinness draft, it's the... It's the baseline dark beer, in my opinion. It's the yep. one that has is kind of ubiquitous. If if you have no, if you have very little knowledge about beer in general, and somebody says a dark beer, a lot of people think, "Oh, lovely day for a Guinness," which is great. And this is what I would call a lawnmower beer, as far as dark beer goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would. This is light bodied enough, light in flavor enough that if I walked in the house from mowing my yard and I opened the fridge. 
this would not put me on the couch. Right. right? So, and that's, again, we'll, we'll talk about the biggest trend in craft beer in just a minute. But this is a great, like, entry level. It's a lot more flavorful than a domestic, but it's still light-bodied. It's low ABV. I believe that it's under 5%. Yeah. So this, um, one of the, and we'll talk about this too. One of the biggest things that differentiates different craft beers is it's playful marketing, right? It's, that is one of the cool things about it being such a progressive industry is that there's not, not a lot of credence given to legacy style branding Mm -hmm. where it's about, we, you know, we have pedigree and we've been, uh, people like throwing around oldest craft brewery in, California right. or Idaho or whatever like people like saying that they have some staying power yep but it's not there's no Ivy League craft beer right right the point is not to say we are we are august and austere and yep. the point is to say that we are fun and we're moving forward and we're doing new things so this is Guinness would maybe be one of the exceptions Guinness would not be lumped into craft beer by most people sure because it's an import because it's got such heredity um, but this, the label in this particular one is from old marketing of theirs from, I think like the thirties. So that toucan has been around for quite a while. Okay. I mean, yeah, you talk about staying power. Yeah. This is definitely outside of the, uh, craft beer world. Yeah. Uh, late 1700s, I think. Wow, I think, man. yeah, I think it's, I think it was 1769. It probably says on there. I think that they just had their 250. Again, please no fact checker. <laughs> So this is... Okay, yeah, so what do we got? This is the Bourbon Council from Cold Fire Brewing out of Eugene, Oregon. They do not have distribution outside of the state. Um, So this is from a visit to the brewery. Um, So this is an imperial stout. It's aged in bourbon barrels. And this is uh, one of the issues that craft beer has to overcome is price point. So little or so much can go into a beer that a domestic beer... For one thing, it's like shopping at Costco. Everything's cheaper in bulk. And so if you're doing 100,000 gallons at a time and you're producing so much, you have grain contracts where you're buying things at such a low price per pound with your malt and your hops and things like that, that you can do, you know, $1 Natty Lights or you can do $1 PBRs. And at as a retailer, you can use that to bring people in to pay for other stuff. This beer... Uh, has to create that high alcohol content requires a huge amount of grain to produce enough fermentable sugar right. to produce that high ABV. It then, right, this is 10.5%, which in the realm of barrel aged bourbon stouts is actually pretty mild. Um, you yeah, can right. have it as high as like 14, 15%. I almost brought the worldwide stout from Dogfish Head, which is, I think, 15.5 or 16%. Wow. But yeah, so a huge amount of ingredients goes into a batch to produce that high amount of fermentable sugar to create that high ABV. It then goes into a barrel, which presents its own cost, and then it sits and pays rent. Right. Right. And so you have, you know, your one dollar natty light, and I forget how much this retails for, but you can have bottles of beer that are like low to mid tier bottles of wine, where you know a sixteen ounce bottle is twenty two bucks. And people look at that and they, and I've actually had for some of the more expensive draft options that we've had on, um, I've actually had people say, how dare you charge $10 for a 10 ounce beer? Wow. That's like, well, it's, you know, you're paying eight bucks for a five ounce glass of wine. Right. Right. But some of it. So we're, again, with that lack of legacy branding comes an unwillingness to pay legacy branding prices. So that's, that's one of the issues that as craft beer becomes more and more refined and they're more unique interesting options right people need to start changing their mentality about beer because this is not anything like a bud light right so this uh the bourbon council from cold fire it has deep caramel notes it has slight roasted quality it's not it's not roasted and bitter like coffee it has a like distinct dark chocolate thing with some malt and then you get Notes of vanilla and caramel and a little bit of smoke from the bourbon barrels. Like this is, again, without pretension. With sweet without, smoke, you know, from, you know, yeah, that bourbon vibe. And the great thing about craft beer, or rather when craft beer is at its best, there's no mustache twirling. There's no right. wax mustache, oh, pretension. 
Right. Right. There's plenty of that in craft beer, but at its best, it's like this is a complex and delicious beverage yep. that's worthy of a price point that corresponds to the amount of labor and ingredients that went into it. Well, as you're saying, as far as time, that the bottle at least said this was stored for two years. Yeah. Which in beer seems slightly unprecedented. Well, and the crazy thing is that this is a four year old brewery. Wow. So two years ago, they were two years old. <laughs> right. And right. And said, you know what? Actually, that's not even true because I've had this aging in my fridge for a year. Okay. Um, so a One year, year. Yeah. a year in, they said, you know what? We're going to take product that we could sell as just an imperial stout right now, and put it into a barrel and pray to God that we're still open in two right. years so that we can right? sell it. That is nuts. Um, that's actually so. That's a great segue into this Founders Dirty Bastard. So Founders is now, I think, the largest brewery in Michigan. If not, they're very close. Um, it's <laughs> this segment should be called White Lies with Tyler and Kobiak because <laughs> I think they're the largest brewery in Michigan. Um, if not, they're very close. So this beer is the beer that put them on the map because they were about to get shut down. Oh, wow. They were overdrawn on all of their loans. They were not making money. This was about 20 years ago. They were just on the precipice of not being a brewery anymore. They couldn't get any of their distributors to sell them malted grain or hops because they were so overdrawn on everything. So they literally took what they had, made a scotch ale, which was not a popular style at the time at all, and said, this is this is our goodbye beer. And people loved it. And wow. the money that they got was enough to get enough ingredients just to make more of this. And it this is the beer that turned them around. It's now been supplanted as their best seller. But this is a great... Excuse me. This is a great craft beer story of yeah, right. these little scrappy guys who didn't know what they were doing but loved beer were losing their shorts on the business <laughs> side but made a quality enough product that people gravitated to it and it turned them around. Totally. Totally. Now, real quick on what we're drinking now. Yeah. You said distribution is limited to Oregon only. Uh, th so they... Um, They've got self-distribution for Oregon, and they're driving trucks of stuff up to Seattle. Okay. But okay. other than that, they're still very much stuck on the coast. Um, got it. So, so I was going to say, would it be, if someone were to do that, is is our breweries thinking in terms of, like, for our brand, I think it's, like, we're at this, we're only going to distribute to regional, like, regions that we think are, you know, good for the brand. Not good for the brand, but it just makes sense here. Yeah, so a lot of breweries open with a certain size in mind. So there are some breweries where the size of equipment that they buy is brew pub equipment. Right. They're making enough beer to make beer in-house. Beer is measured in barrels, which is 31 gallons. Um, 31 gallons is a huge amount of weight. And so right. there used to actually be, so if, there used to be barrel kegs. One of my distributors, a guy named Stacy Springer, he does great job getting us the beer that we need. He's been in the industry long enough that he actually saw some of the last of the actual metal barrel kegs. They weighed like 300 pounds. So beer is measured in barrels. It's now sold in the large kegs that you typically see is a half barrel, which is 15.5 gallons. And then this, like the taller cylindrical smaller kegs, those are called sixtals because it's a sixth of a barrel. It's 15, or excuse me, 5.17 gallons. Anyway. Brewery production, beer production is measured in gallon, or excuse me, in barrels, which is 31 gallons. And so a nano brewery might be a one or two barrel system. Okay. Right. You're making between 30 and 60 gallons of beer at a time. Wow. A microbrewery, right, a small brew pub might be on a five or a seven barrel system. Right. Which you're producing like 14 kegs at a time. The if you want to be a production brewery, if the goal is to be a production brewery, you often will start with like a 10 or a 15 barrel system so that each batch is 20 to 30 kegs. And often as you can grow from there pretty quickly because you can start doing double batches where if you have a 15 barrel brew house, which is basically the enormous heated kettle that you're making things in, you can get a 30 barrel fermenter. You can double batch in your brew house and basically do two batches in one day, send it all to the fermenter, and that's where it'll ferment. Got it. Um, so, you know, if a brewery opens with a five-barrel system, yep. they're probably just aiming to be a brew pub. Right? If they open with a larger system, they're going to try to get established in their local area and then try to pick up distribution. Okay. 
because that is, you know, there are two types of breweries. There are breweries that self-distribute and there are breweries that have distribution. And having distribution means that you give up some control of where your beer goes because it's going to be a negotiation between the brewery and the distributor of, all right, how is my beer sold in the market? So, like, one thing I'm thinking of is I mentioned to you, well, and I came out, especially for the night that you guys had New Holland right. on tap. Uh, one of your guys, Zach Wilkie, yeah. and I were Horrible both. Horrible human beings. <laughs> yeah, couldn't agree more. Right. We were in, uh, <laughs> we went to school together in Minneapolis. One of the things that we loved most was Dragon's Milk on tap. Yeah. Really, really good. And I think it may have been my senior year that it actually finally went. Uh, they got distribution in Texas. And my dad was like, I'm going to pick up a few. I think they sold it in like fours. Yeah. Um, and my dad had it in the fridge when I got home, I think after graduation, which was very cool. Um, but it's summer in Texas is for real. (laughs) Yeah. And I just remember thinking like, it just doesn't hit the way it does like in February. Right. In Minneapolis. And it's a tough sell for me. And obviously I'm, I'm pumped. I I think distribution means they're doing well and I, I love the beer. So I'm pumped that it's going around. It wasn't until I had it here when you guys had it. That I was like, oh yeah, I missed this so much, and it would yeah. just hit the spot. So what 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 do you find in the Northwest that's like a very Northwest vibes works well here? If um, that resonates at all, it, it it is or it does rather. So seasonality is a huge part of it. Um, I love beers like this Bourbon Council. I love big, hit you over the head, one and done beers. Um, some of that is just because I don't. Um, I probably drink less now than I ever have in my life because I don't drink at work for context. I'm six foot seven and 400 pounds. And if there were ever an issue to happen at work, I don't need to be that plus a couple of beers. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I don't drink at work and I probably taste beer every day when we tap something new, I'm trying things, but I probably sit down and have a beer at work once or twice a month. So for me, I want, I want big bang for my buck. If I'm going to sit down and have a beer, I want to have a beer that is an experience that as this beer, so we poured about half of this bottle. We'll try it again at the end. As it continues to warm up, it's going to open up and change and develop. Like I want, I personally want a big experience beer. Yep. And I'm maybe unique in that way because I drink considerably less than our clientele. Sure. But it is much like you said, it's about seasonality and context. Um, one of the reasons that craft beer is doing so well in the Northwest is because 75% of the nation's hops are grown in central Washington. Oh, wow. The Yakima Valley is where is the hop basket of the U.S. Wow. And there's a huge amount of grain grown from Montana all the way over. So we really are in the lap of some of the best produced ingredients for beer in the country. Totally. So because of that, a lot of people prioritize local ingredients and things like that for what they want in their beverage more than anything it's time and place if i'm going to have if i'm going to sit down at tap and i'm going to have our you know our new york strip i'm going to have a big beer like yep, this right if i'm going to sit down with guys and watch a game i'm going to want three or four light lagers yep right i think that seasonality you know time of year is going right. to dictate the weight the heaviness of beer that you want but more than anything, the context, what you're actually doing is going to dictate the type of beer that you want to be drinking. Right. Um, and that's one of the things that's incredible about craft beer is that you've got, you know, these big malt bomb, put you on your butt beers. And then you have, you know, premium craft lagers that are super light with balanced flavor, low ABV that you could drink again out on the boat all afternoon. Sure, sure. Um as opposed to being a brewery with one style with three variations, you know, right. Bud, Bud Light, Bud Light Lime. <laughs> um, right, you know, right. It's where you've got this very narrow range of of what kind of experience dictates drinking that beer. Yep. And in some ways, that's the lowest common denominator, right? That light lager, you can drink, it's designed for you to drink a ton of them, right? Without right. getting much of a buzz, right? The only right, right the only thing that you're going to do if you drink a bunch of Bud Light is go to the bathroom a lot. As opposed to if you were to drink three of these, yep. right? It's, you know, it'd take a team of people to get you in yeah. a cab. So I wonder, I wonder if that's played a big role even in just drinking experiences around the country. Hopefully. 
I, I, so, I never thought about it from that angle at all. So Supper of the Lamb by Father Capon is yeah. one of my favorite books. And he talks about the tin fiddle issue, which is basically that to make a Stradivarius takes months of months of building and, you know, years and years of experience. I get that you can't build Stradivariuses anymore because he's dead. All right. But to make to make a fine violin takes years of practice and skill development. And then the actual process is hugely expensive and time consuming. Right. Or you can take, build a die and stamp tin and make a tin fiddle. Right. And you can mass produce those and you can produce thousands of those in the times that it would take to make a wooden violin. And the tin fiddle is cheaper. It's more accessible. You're going to buy more of it. And if it breaks, you can just buy another one. We live in a tin fiddle society. Right. I think that I, I genuinely believe that we make the best burger in Moscow. And I don't believe that there's been a single day where we have outsold McDonald's. <laughs> right. It's probably it's probably true, right? And that that saddens me, yeah. but that is the case, and that's well, the it's culture. cheating. They have two of them. <laughs> I don't. I don't think we've outsold either <laughs> yeah. McDonald's in Moscow, even on our best days. Right? Maybe our best day, we outsold McDonald's on their worst day. Right. But again, we're we're engaged with a tin fiddle society where we'd rather get the cheap, accessible thing. Right, then work for or wait for the higher quality thing and certainly not pay for the higher quality thing. So because of that, the most commonly consumed beer in the U.S. is beer that is not designed to enhance an aesthetic experience. It is to maintain a buzz. You pound three or four of them at the beginning of your night, and as long as you're drip-free feeding yep. yourself with bud, you get to just maintain that ride buzz yep. and keep that ride going. Um, as opposed to if you were to drink even just like a, a kind of straight up the middle, like six and a half percent alcohol, 60 IBU, which is international bitterness unit, um, IPA, you have three of them and your, your body doesn't want more, right? It's a lot of flavor. It's right. more filling. It's you're, you know, you can have a handful of them and that's going to be different for different people. But you sit down and your limit is going to be a lot lower as far as number of them that you can consume yeah. in a given session. The point of all of that being that it's a great sign that in the U.S. beer consumption is actually on a decline, but craft beer is on an incline. So craft, craft beer consumption is growing. Beer consumption overall is on a decline as people discover that they're intolerant to gluten or common sense. And... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. But right, but what's happening is a pinch on that tin fiddle beer, on that mass-produced, low-quality, low-quality experience beer, that's starting to get pinched. I don't know if you saw the Super Bowl ads for Bud Light Seltzer. Do you know why it's called Bud Light Seltzer? Why? So that they can see, keep saying that Bud Light is the most consumed beverage in the world. Got it. Or rather in the U.S., the most consumed beer in the U.S., because it's not Bud Light. It's a seltzer. Right. Right. It's a completely different beverage, but they put the name Bud Light on it so that they can continue to claim that their market share is strong. I was perusing some some Forbes articles. What are the trends? And then what you were saying with the marketing is it can be fun. It can be playful because it's sort of about like we're just reacting in certain right. terms. And beer is obviously built for that because, you know, it's not necessarily barrel aged for very long. Um, the seltzer market. It's booming. It's insane. You know, I don't know that there's a right answer here, but you wonder, like, with how fast things are moving, um, and since it's so highly reactive to the market, are we is Tapped going to have like half their taps filled with seltzer beers? <laughs> like, what what is happening? Is this bad? Is this you know? Well, that's so. So first of all, it's not bad. It's not right? bad, we, right? You know, I need bad. to I need to keep the wax out of my mustache. I need to make sure that there is no. Right. Hipster pretension of sure. like, well, no, that's, you know, it's, there's so many stupid kind of presuppositions of like cider is for girls. Yep. How is a beverage for girls? <laughs> right. I affirm the difference between men and women, but not when it comes to palate. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a good beverage is a good beverage. Right. Okay. Seltzer is for young people. No, it's not like it's so any kind of like, no, that's a bad drink. Right. Is not, is not a conversation that I think has much merit. However, as far as the focus of our business, right, we're a tap house that focuses on beer, cider, and wine. Right. 
Seltzer doesn't really fit into that. Seltzer, again, does not have the flavor that I think enhances our food. I don't think that it has an aesthetic or a flavor quality that stands up to the quality of a lot of the beverages that we have on. So we actually will be tapping a seltzer on Wednesday because we're doing a tap takeover with a brewery out of Spokane called No Lie. Oh, yes, right. And they make a seltzer. Okay. And they, That's tomorrow, right? That's Jeez, that is tomorrow. Okay. Um, I'm going to have a busy Tuesday. <laughs> anyway, good thing I'm drinking. Yeah. That'll make getting yeah. everything done easier. Um, but no, so we, and we have tapped one other seltzer before, and it was for a different event. So we, I don't consciously bring them in. I'm not seeking out seltzers. But How do they do when you do tap them? I'm not well. Okay. But again, it's context. Sure. That you don't, you know, you don't come in for our gumbo, which is made from scratch, and think, you know what would be good with this, right? right? Bubble right. water with right. a hint of, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> Bubble water that was yeah. stored next to a cherry. Yeah, like, right. It's all of the, all of the LaCroix jokes apply to yep. most seltzers. Yeah. Um, well, and I feel like very connected, right? I mean, oh, absolutely. The boom came, of LaCroix. Right, was followed immediately by some very smart person going, you know what, guys, if yeah. we put booze in this. Right. Whoever's at White Claw was just like, let's just park outside of that university's, you know, every sorority in the world who was drinking LaCroix. Yeah. And and there we have it. I guess I guess I should modify my former statement about there not being such a thing as a bad beverage. Oh, it's yeah. I mean, obviously there is such a thing as a poorly made beverage. Sure. Um, but I also think that producing a beverage for the wrong reasons yep. um is going to be detrimental. So the right the the fad of the seltzer is about diet, right? right? It's about having your cake and eating, eating it too. too. It's about being able to consume alcohol without putting on weight. Yep. Um, which I mean, you watch guys who go into fraternities who go in right with flat stomachs yeah. and come out with beer guts. Yeah. Um, it's I under if you want to drink to excess and not gain weight then yeah, seltzers make perfect sense. And again, right. I do think go back to that whole kind of tin fiddle thing that I was talking about earlier. So I'm, I'm not a fan of seltzers, not because I think that they're gross. Sure. Right? I, had, I had some white claw at a picnic this summer and we were playing volleyball and it was great. Made because, sense. Yeah. yeah, because if I had had, again, some of this bourbon council stout, um, yep. my game would have suffered. <laughs> my game as fine as it right, is right. would have suffered. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, dude, what is next? I feel we got two more. Yeah, so let's let's kind of try. Let's just do a little bit of that avalanche. I do want to come back to that, so I put my yep. cup down. Yeah. Okay. Man, that trick is awesome. On the day that I got married, my older brother Brandon, who is a phenomenal human being, walked up to me and said, "You have a ring now. I'm going to show you how to open bottles with your ring." And while I can't claim that that's the best or most useful advice he's ever given me because he's been a huge blessing in my life, I do use that one the most. <laughs> that sounds like a very practical, it sounds like very practical. He's a very practical human yeah, being. Yeah. Do you say brother or brother-in-law? Brother. Brother. Yeah. Okay, awesome. The, the scary Aunt Kobiak. Is he here? He, have I uh, met Brandon? I don't think you have. He and his family are actually moving back. But Brandon is almost as tall as I am. He's okay. broader across the shoulders. Is my hands look like a kid's when wow. in his when we shake hands. It's also covered in tattoos and prematurely gray. So I'm Love 29. That. He's 31. I'm definitely I'm got like three inches on him, yeah. and no one is afraid of me. That's hilarious. it's like Ty, Tyler is made of jello and hugs, but like Brandon is like is the scary one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's got to be one of you. Right. Exactly. Good cop, bad cop. Yeah. I feel like you guys could do some. No, damage he's on a bad cop. <laughs> okay. Okay, so which one is this? Sorry. So this Avalanche. is the Avalanche Amber Ale from Breckenridge. And I don't actually love this beer, which is why it was still in my fridge. But it's okay. interesting because this is what old school craft beer tastes like to me. Interesting. And Breckenridge is not a terribly old brewery. But... Do they do... What else do they do? They have a... Oh, shoot. Coffee porter? porter? Uh, vanilla porter. Van, is vanilla it the, porter yeah. from them that's very... I forget what it's very called. Very well Ch known and liked. I think it's just called Vanilla Porter. I don't okay. think that it has a name. There's a, there's a Chocolate Porter something or other that me and Zach used to have, too, all the time. Anyway, continue. Sorry. Um, but anyway, so the thing that is interesting about this beer in particular is that if you taste it, it's it's an amber ale, so yep. it's primarily malt. There's not a ton of hop presence to it. But you get this kind of like molasses, raisiny, almost dried fruit kind of flavor yeah. to it. 
that is a very old school, like English malt profile. Yes. Okay. Right. Very, very much not what's kind of in vogue right now. Right. Um, which is much more like biscuity, caramelly, kind of less dried fruit, more caramelized grain flavors. Yep. And it's super light bodied, low ABV. Yeah. 5% alcohol. So it's 0.8% higher ABV than your typical Budweiser. Um, but it's got way more flavor and it's got way more yep. complex flavor. So this one is interesting. I feel interesting. like that could be lost too with what you were saying in terms of what's in vogue right now is like the IPA or even what we just had where it's just treating your tongue like a punching bag. Right. Well, and frankly, I didn't bring any IPAs because they're so ubiquitous that yep. if you look at the craft beer section on the shelf in your grocery store, it's probably 60% IPAs. Yeah, so what's up with that? And 40% all other styles. Tell me about IPAs. Um, IPAs are a middle finger to the big breweries. Right? You get that vibe. Well, and that is that is what craft beer was born out of. So you had all of these, again, we shouldn't do the whole history, but prohibition is a big deal as far as development of beer in the U.S., where you had this great diversity of beer, and then basically it all gets shut down at prohibition. Post-prohibition, you have breweries that have industrialized right and come that have embraced new refrigeration techniques new malting techniques things like that and new distribution right and refrigerated distribution survive right and other ones don't and that's how you get the narrowing of the field to the kind of handful of big domestic beer producers um so and then in the very late 70s in chico california sierra nevada introduces their pale ale Right. As kind of what most people call the first craft beer in the U.S. Okay. Um, and at that point, it would still be called microbrewing. Uh, the term microbrewing has fallen out of vogue since a lot of craft breweries have gotten very big. Right. They have national distribution. New Belgium, I think, produced over a million barrels wow. of beer last year. So, I mean, what, 30 million gallons? Wow. There's nothing micro about that yeah but it's still hyper hands-on hyper intentional there's a huge amount of craft that goes into it yep. it's just not small anymore so anyway so sierra nevada kind of kicked it off oh absolutely the so the sierra okay. nevada pale ale was the we want beer with flavor okay. gesture yeah um, yeah yeah and and again ale ale is a much more accessible beer style to brew for a couple of reasons ale yeast um is a much more robust quicker moving yeast than lager yeast okay and so if you have limited fermentation space if you have limited equipment you can crank out two ales for each lager okay and so for a small production it makes much more sense to be doing ales right and ale yeast has much more flavor to it and its flavors are very complementary to the flavor of hops right and so so they were like more hops yeah absolutely if you're tired of lowest common denominator lame lager Let's make an ale. Let's and again, Sierra yep. Nevada Pale Ale is so tame now sure, compared sure. to what other people were doing five years ago when Tapped was first becoming a thing. Big like double and triple, like punch you in the face, scrape your tongue with a pine cone IPAs, like ten and a half percent and one hundred and twenty IBUs. That was like the thing. Oh yeah. And thank heaven that's gone because at the end of the day, it's about. Is it gone? It's not gone, but it's not the thing anymore. Sure, so sure. the thing that. That was immediately replaced with session IPAs, which were worse. Um, really? So session IPA was you left all the hops, but you backed out a bunch of malt, lower ABV. Because 10.5%, 120 IBU IPA, you drink two of those and it's like, all right, let's go home. And again, that is the, that is the issue when you're fighting tin fiddle mentality right. is right. that let's say that a six pack of craft beer is 10 bucks, right? And a 24 pack... Or a 12 pack of Bud Light is 10 bucks. Well, now we want people drinking more of our beer. And so they went from these big, like just hyper intense, too intense IPAs to session IPAs where they backed a bunch of the malt out. So you had a much lower ABV, but they were super unbalanced, okay. right? They had all of this like bitterness and hop character to them without enough malt to balance it out. Yeah. Right. And then in the wake of session IPAs, a much better style beer craft lager became more of a thing where people okay. started making these really clean, really crisp, flavorful, but very light bodied lagers to compete with, with the, the other... with the domestics. Got it. Right. But you take 
kind of all of the good qualities of domestic. It's light, it's crisp, you can drink a handful of them without getting knocked out. But they kept the flavor and they kept the quality. And a lot of the off flavors like, you know, cream corn and things like that that you can t- really is a thing that you can wow. get in those domestic beers. Okay. Um you can yeah, you can get some cardboardy and some acetyl flavors and things like that. Right there are focused on making a really high quality light lager. And that's had some staying power. They make a lot of those. Um, but the thing that's come into the IPA scene now is what people will call New England IPAs and hazy IPAs and juicy IPAs. Basically, hops have three things going for them, right? They have bitterness, yep. they have flavor, and they have aroma. And depending on when you put hops into your boil, the process of right drawing the fermentable sugar out of the grain... Depending on when you put the hops in, early edition hops pretty much just bring bitterness, right? The volatile compounds that produce aroma get boiled off, right? So early editions just bring bitterness. Mid editions bring flavor and some bitterness. And late editions bring very little bitterness, but they bring flavor and a lot of aroma. And so IPA styles have switched to from a lot of early edition hop introduction that brings a lot of bitterness to very little early edition and very much late edition. So you're getting lots of flavor, lots of aroma, but very little bitterness. Okay. Yeah, bitter and hoppy are not identical things. And so I, the IPA trend now has swung to very juicy, citrusy, floral, right? Strongly aromatic IPAs. And because it's less bitter, you need less malt to balance it out. Right. So you can lower the ABV. So this is what session IPAs should have been four years ago, right? right? It's lower ABV, but it's still got a very strong hot presence. It's got balanced flavor. It's got good mouthfeel. It's got good body. So I think IPAs are in a very good spot right now, as opposed to where they were four years ago, where it was just... So like IPAs are just old enough. Now they're friends with their parents again. Right, exactly. (laughs) They went through that, like, they went through that old... They they did a study abroad. (laughs) They came back and now they're cultured. Yep. We're out of cuffs, man. I'm sorry. That's okay. But I I think this one was good enough to, to... Pour in again. Yeah. When especially we're going to go from there to the um, Founder's Dirty Bastard, which is going to be, style-wise, it's considered a Scotch Ale, which is basically like a more robust, mildly smoky amber. And you said this one is out of... Grand Rapids, Michigan. Grand Rapids, okay. It's a, I've actually been... So my wife is from Michigan. Okay. Again, we were talking about her phenomenal artwork yes. earlier. yeah. But yeah, she's from Michigan. When we saw her folks over Christmas a couple of years ago, we got to go to the brewery. Oh, wow. It's an incredible brewery. If you're ever in the area, it's definitely worth going out of the way for. Besides just making phenomenal beer, the brewery itself was very interesting. They essentially bought a city block and have little room left to expand. And so every their building is incredibly tall. And every piece of brewery equipment that they have is the tall, skinny version of that brewery equipment. Oh, wow. And they actually brew more beer per square inch than any other brewery in the country. Wow. Because it's like walking through their fermentation tanks and things like that. It's like walking through skyscrapers. Really, if you're ever in the area, it's worth it's worth a couple hour drive for. Totally. Yeah. I feel like Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota are like really big powerhouses. Yeah, so with there are beer. kind of there are three uh four four kind of main in my opinion, main hubs of craft brewing. Okay. There's California. Oh, really? There. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are so many of the big established craft breweries. Okay. Like Stone and Ballast Point. Ballast Point. Um, Sierra Nevada. You've got all these really yep. big established craft breweries down there. Okay. The Northwest, which is a bit more of an indie craft brewing scene. You've got a lot of smaller regionally distributed breweries who are doing phenomenal stuff. The Midwest, again, though, Wisconsin, yep. Minnesota, Michigan. It's always so cold. What else are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. And then actually North Carolina has a huge, robust okay. craft brewing scene as well. Texas is starting to that. catch up as well. Like it's it's catching everywhere. Yeah. But those kind of four would be the strongholds. Um, again, we're up to 8,000 breweries in the U.S. Yeah. So uh, what's going to happen? Huh. This this bubble's gonna pop, right? Well, it's. I think it. I think it is going to. I think it's gonna pop, but I don't think that it's gonna be a huge dramatic pop, okay. in my opinion. Again, one of the one of the features of craft brewing that makes it work so well is that it's hyper dynamic, and so you know, if you were a brewery that said, "No, we're not gonna do a hazy IPA," you'd start to get left behind. And some breweries will do that. They'll ignore trends. They won't play along. 
but most breweries most brewers are are fun creative engaged people who are like new ipa yeah let's do it i'm so bored of what i've been doing for six weeks right so craft brewing is very dynamic i don't think that I don't think that the bubble is going to burst in a, oh, nobody's drinking craft beer way. Right. Like, it's just, it's not going to happen like that, in my opinion. What I do think is going to happen is that there's going to be this inverse bell curve where you have, you know, if you talk about the bell curve in terms of distribution, you have tiny, like, brew pubs that have zero distribution, Right. And then you have the really big guys at the other end of the bell curve that are heavily distributed. They're in grocery stores all over the country. And then you have this sector in the middle, which is regionally distributed. Okay. So, you know, let's say that you are a, a brewery in Coeur d'Alene and you're distributed in Washington, Idaho and Western Montana. And or you're in Boise and you're just all throughout the state of Idaho. What's going to happen, I think, is that you're going to be too big to be hip and too small to be strong. And we're going to see some fallout in the middle because people are really gravitating towards their neighborhood brewery. Um, So there, I'm sure that there are people who would say that Hungadunga across the street from you guys is their favorite brewery. Yeah. Because it's theirs, because it's local, because it's the brew. They know the owner, they know the brewer, they know the bartender, they know the guy who sweeps out back. They know, yeah. Right. It's their thing and they feel some ownership in it because it's from their community and there are people who will be hyper loyal to that beer till the end. Yeah. Right. And then there are people who will be on the opposite end of the spectrum. Well, I know that everywhere I go, I can get a Sierra Nevada pale ale or a Ballast Point Sculpin IPA or right. whatever. And you can get that anywhere in the country. And I think that some of those bigger established guys as long as they continue to be mobile, as long as they continue to work with trends, will be able to stay because it takes a huge amount of work to get uh, into a grocery store. Reps, you know, for them, they love places like us because we're fun and we're dynamic and we get to show the stuff that often just stays in the brewery, right? They really like tap houses. They prefer to work with on-premise is what they call keg sales. They'd really prefer, or keg and package that's sold out of restaurants and things like that. So they'd love working with on-premise people like me. Okay. But I don't make nearly as much money for them as Winco will right. Right. or as Rose Hours or Safeway. Right. Right. So their their big job is to get into grocery stores because grocery stores, you know, for us, we do rotating kegs. When you empty something, you replace it with something else. Uh, we featured over 600 unique beers at Tapped in 2019. Wow. Um, Say that number again. 600. Wow. Like we were able to present a lot of different beers from our business model, right? You empty a keg, you replace it with something else. But we're never, again, just like we're never going to sell as many burgers as McDonald's, we're never going to sell as much beer as Winco. Yeah. And so for them, it's much better to get package, a package contract where they're keeping their flagship IPA on the shelf at Rose Hours for the next three months. It's often seasonal and it's often month long or three month long contracts. Right. Like for them. So a brewery that can get an established foothold in right in chain grocery stores is going to have a huge amount of staying power. What I think is going to be negatively impacted when this slows down is those regional breweries that are distributed in a state or two. They're not small enough to be my hip local favorite. They're not big enough to have the staying power of somebody who's got grocery store contracts. Sure. And at the end of the day, it's in the distributor's hands. So if I am losing, you know, if a beer has a relatively short shelf life, it's you really shouldn't sell beer after 90 days. Wow. For an IPA, you should sell it as quickly as you can. Those volatile polyphenolic compounds dissipate very quickly. Like it's most people say, you know, you should be pouring IPAs within a month. Something that's more malt heavy, you can pour within a couple of months. And something big and barrel aged that's actually going to like soften, mellow, and round out, you can age for quite a long time. It's probably going to get better on the back end. Absolutely. Um, But most beer should be sold within a couple of months of being produced. And purists would say the sooner the better. So if you are a small regional brewery, you're becoming less hip, you're losing ground to the big guys, and I have to throw away some of your beer because it goes out of date, well, we might not re-up with you next year. We might get rid of you, and I've seen that happen over the couple of years that we've been operating. Some of those mid-sized breweries that had statewide distribution 
have just closed. Right. And often it's because there's just not enough staying power. So if, if the owners go through a family crisis, they just can't keep it going. Right. Or if they have one bad batch that they need to throw away, it can ruin the P&L for the quarter and they just can't catch back up. Like it's that. Yeah, it's I mean, real life stuff. Absolutely. Like I said, it's a very dynamic industry and that allows people to be very mobile and very aggressive. But it can also be crippling because if you if you're behind on the trend, if you miss out on the next thing or if you have one minor calamity, it might be the end of your brewery. Right. Because right, that small size allows them to be nimble, but it also allows them to get knocked over by by mid sized problems. Yeah. By the way, this very right. interesting. Right, great. Not counter- exact. Not at all where I thought we were going to go. Right, great counterpoint to the avalanche. So we're drinking the um, dirty bastard from Founders. Again, can't speak highly enough of them. Although they are one of those breweries that they're huge. And had some really negative PR in the last year that really slowed them down. Really? Because at the end of the day, people have to buy your beer. There was an accusation of racist practices in their management because a guy got fired who maybe shouldn't have been fired. Or to be honest, I don't wanna I don't wanna promote my opinion because it'll because it's a personal opinion, not the restaurant's opinion. But we continue to sell their beer, if that is any indication sure, of what, sure, sure. what I think of them. But this is a great beverage. It's robust. It's got a much more new school malt profile. It's got a little bit of smokiness to it. But again, intensely flavorful. I immediately thought, like, this is the American version of what we... That was... Avalanche felt much more like the English vibe. Absolutely. And it was like, okay, now we're in the American one. Well, the reason I I mentioned this before we started recording, the reason that I brought Avalanche is because it's an interesting story of distribution. Breckenridge is out of Colorado, and I mean, proximity wise, we're relatively close to them. They don't have much of a foothold in this market. Okay. I was back in Maryland over the holidays seeing my family, and then we went on vacation down in North Carolina. Breckenridge was everywhere, they were all over the place. And so often, right, priorities of distribution will dictate how you do in a market. Okay. So again, if you're a mid sized brewery that's struggling to move product, the distributor can kill you, right? Totally. Or at least reduce you back to a regional or, totally. you know, excuse me, a purely local thing. When you said founders, I don't know that I've had F- Dirty Bastard at Tapped, but I know I see founders quite right. a bit. It's, I mean, we've had, we've had Dirty Bastard on, um, their flagship beer is their all day IPA. Um, okay. Okay. Maybe. Which you probably see all over the place. It's my favorite, again, knowing the type of beer that I like, founders, I believe has the best barrel aging program in the midwest okay it's there maybe one or two northwest breweries that i and one california brewery where i would call it a tie um firestone walker has a phenomenal barrel aging program okay everything that they do is just over the top crazy coming out of barrels freem out of hood river oregon they were voted um best mid-sized brewery in the nation in 2018 they have some of the most like subtle complex barrel aged beers and we didn't even talk, we're like, there's a, such a huge spectrum of what beer can be. We haven't even mentioned sour beers or alternative yeah, fermenters those are wild bit, ales. And those like, are growing, I feel like. No? Absolutely. The sours? That's, that's the thing that's crazy about beer in general. And I'm not going after any other type of beverage. But what beer can be is such an incredibly large spectrum. So, again, wine can be hugely complex. But the spectrum of what wine can be is more about depth than about breadth. Okay. Right? That you've got, essentially, you've got one ingredient. Yep. Right? You've got grapes. Yep. And how you manipulate that ingredient is going to, and obviously yeast, and if you want to include it as an ingredient, the barrel. And how you manipulate that ingredient, right, and how that ingredient is grown, right, the grapes themselves really dictate what wine is going to be. And there's a huge depth of complexity to what wine can be. But at the end of the day, you have two essential categories for wine, red and white. And there's a plethora of subcategories. Sure. But it's a narrow spectrum with a huge depth of complexity. Right. Beer, you've got three main ingredients, right? You've got the malted barley, the hops, and the yeast. 
but you have so many variations of that that you can have beers that taste like they're not even the same beverage. Right. right? You Again, sour beers, beers with wild fermenters, can be tannic like red wine just from the fermenting agent. Like there's such a breadth and complexity of beer. And because of that, it's incredibly democratic. Yeah. Right? That you've got this huge spectrum of options. And so people can say, I don't like 90% of beer. Right. But I like this 10%. Right. Right. Or, you know, I love, I, I don't like a lot of IPAs, but I love this style of IPA. Or I love dark barrel aged beer. Like there's this huge, huge representation of what beer can be that is not, again, not absent in other beverages. I just think it's more intensely diverse in beer than anything else. Totally. Now, there's something you were saying earlier with, uh, Moscow has a plethora of places. So we have, you mentioned Hungadungo. Or, right. Uh, there's you guys. I feel like uh, Moscow Ale House. Yeah. There's, there's uh, Rants and Raves. Rants and Raves. Brewing Company. Um, yeah. When I had, um, I had James Agerbretson on to talk about marketing and other things like design and things like that. One of the things I talked about was um, the, the loyalty thing. Yeah. It's not often based on um, an actual, like, line of judgments where i'm like well they've got this not this but this like generally if somebody asked me to go for a beer ale house is not where i would go we're gonna probably gonna go to tapped you know when dane wilson offered lunch to me before christmas we just went to tapped yeah so do you guys see like for tapped as you think about how you're gonna run your business because we've been talking a lot about beer but it, essentially you are the prize for breweries to some extent. Like, obviously, you're not Winco. We talked about that. Right. But, I mean, you are the place that breweries want to get into. Do you sort of see yourself as, like, we're going to we're gonna run hard at making the tapped experience so that, you know, we're basically serving this loyal brand of customers that kind of just think about us. Right. Uh, like, how do you think about that in terms of, like, when you market or when you do those kinds of things? So, so in my mind, businesses that are successful, um, and it's funny because at this point in – my responsibilities at Tapped are less beer oriented and more business oriented. So right, we right. have a, and frankly, a longer conversation about this than we did about beer. In my mind, businesses that are successful identify what their product actually is. Right? Okay. So Starbucks, the product is not coffee, right? The product is lifestyle. If you wanted to, if you wanted to paint a picture of your typical Starbucks girl. Yep. Right with the Uggs and with the branded Starbucks thing yep. and with the venti blended, uh, something blended, right. or whatever. Like it's there is a lifestyle that goes with that product. It's like Abercrombie marketing their yep. clothes with naked people with guys right? not wearing their shirts. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's like what yeah. it, right. Your product is not clothing. Your product is is sex appeal. Your product yep. is right appearance. And so for us, I think that it's really key that we identify what our actual product is. Yeah, and to Besides some of the specialty stuff that we bring in, you can get most of what we sell at the grocery store. Okay. Right. You can get yeah. you can get beer at the grocery store. You can get a burger at McDonald's. Right. Right. What we sell is experience, and ideally, what we sell is community. That's that good. What, that what you come to tap for is not. I we want the product, right? The product to be as amazing as possible. We want to put on the best craft beer. We want to do everything that we do excellently and to the glory of God, right? But at the end of the day, what you're coming to tap for is the experience, how those products are delivered. If you look at our Yelp reviews, okay, it's we have relatively solid standing on Yelp. I think we're like four and a half stars, which I'm thrilled about. But if you look at our three and four star reviews, they're about the products. If you look mm. at the five star reviews and the occasional one star review, those are always about service, right? There is nothing, there are few things, there's nothing more intimate that I can do for a person than feed them, right? I'm going to prepare something for you to put into your body. And if yep. you feel satisfied with that, right, then the experience that you had is going to be delightful. If you are moderately dissatisfied with that, you're going to feel insulted, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's a very primal aspect it of is, like It is an do. incredibly, and again, if you... The sin that started this all off was eating the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. Right. The resolution to it is at the Lord's Supper, and we get to practice good hospitality right. and eating at Tapped. 
And so the ability to provide somebody with a service where they feel that they are cared for and prioritized, that they've been invited into our community, that the person who is taking care of them understands what we have and understands their needs and is a liaison to make those two very diverse things match, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good the product is. If the experience isn't there, then the perceived value is gone. That's good. Right. And so for us, we, well, we of course try to make sure that the product is keyed in and exactly where it needs to be. At the end of the day, you're coming to tap for experience, right? Coming to tap for service. And we really need to make sure that we're knocking it out of the park on that because service can overcome bad product, right? We yeah. churn and burn like Applebee's. But we make as many things from scratch as most of the higher end restaurants in the area. Yep. Right. We've built in this tension and this hard to execute model into what we do. There will be mistakes, but we can mitigate those mistakes with good service. It's a bad product experience is a soft lob to a server to make a great customer service experience. Right. And so for us, while we are a craft beer venue, we are a gastro pub. Um, what we want to be as a part of the community. That's really good. That's really yeah. good. And at I think our you're best, exactly I think right. that's what we are. I think you're exactly right. I think like the best, you know, the people that are going to say like, we just go to tapped is the community aspect. Right. For example, Ryan. Ryan Hayes, been, our head bartender, a, certified Cicerone. Yes. Like huge staple. And it's so fun. Like when I bring in, uh, whether it's like family or people visiting, it's like the first thing I tell them about is Ryan. Yeah. One of my favorite guys uh the cicerone thing you mentioned i mean it's just like heading for the top of the, yeah. the so beer for those world. of you who don't know uh, the cicerone is the beer equivalent of a sommelier um cicerone program there's four levels certified beer server which is what i am certified cicerone which is what ryan is um then there's an advanced cicerone and a master cicerone master cicerone i think there's less than 50 yeah advanced would be a camp of less than a thousand and Ryan is planning on taking his advance before the end of the year. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so he's awesome. And he's always been so fun. When I go in, I just go right to Ryan. Whoever my server is going to be. Yeah. Like if I'm not at the bar, I just head straight to Ryan and I talk to him about, he knows kind of like what I like, which is obviously the community aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and it's one thing I've talked to you about is Tapped is unique because every six weeks, the menu changes as far as beer goes yeah which is definitely different than i think how most people have considered when i go to my favorite place the guy's already pouring what he knows i like or right. something like that so you guys have like a unique thing but i don't think that slows you down in it, any way it creates uh somebody somebody i was having a conversation with somebody a week or two ago and they asked why we make things so hard on ourselves <laughs> We do a different burger every week. We do right. at least two other specials every week. We're constantly rotating. We do these huge takeovers that create a real inventory nightmare. Um, because so, going Because yeah. bringing in 24 beers at a single time, you then have to sell through it all because in a week or two weeks, you're doing it again. Yep. Um, when the shot clock for the beers that you already had on right. are still running. Exactly. Yep. So, yeah, we do things the hard way. Because at the end of the day, I love this community, right? And doing things the hard way at the price point that we do is the best thing that we can do for this community. Right. Right. And I mean, obviously it's so one of the first things that I talk about when I bring in a new server is our responsibility is to resolve the oxymoronic phrase, hospitality industry. Okay. (laughs) Right. Yeah, we yeah. operate in the hospitality industry. Those two words don't make sense together, right? Hospitality is shut off your back for anybody who comes through your door. Industry is right turning product and people into money. Right. Right. How do we resolve those two things? And the mentality has been that we hide the industry with the hospitality, right? At the end of the day, if you give somebody enough hospitality, Right. If you take care of them thoroughly enough, if you work hard enough to create a product that you're proud of, if you generate an experience that transcends dollar value. Right. Then at the end of the day, there is the formality of the check. Right. But it becomes the least important part of the experience as opposed to the most. Right. Right. If you have a mediocre experience, how much you spent on it becomes very important. 
Yep. If you have a phenomenal experience where you are satisfied and well taken care of, there's obviously an upper dollar amount that you're comfortable with. We try to make sure that we price things in such a way that whatever you get, you're comfortable paying for. Sure. And, have, and feeling generous to, to pay on top of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. I totally agree. I think I was thinking about, as you're saying, like the names of the servers that I can mention off the top of my head just because of the time that I've spent at Taps and whatever and enjoy. And like you said, you have some bad apples like Zach Wilkie. Right. Jacob, Jacob Rush. Rush. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there are those. But, you know, you have your good ones. Uh, last time we talked, I feel like the last time we got to really chat was when you had Dragon's Milk on tap. Yeah. And I was asking, like, man, it's weird that I don't th- – I think mentally I would have thought – well, it's one of those places I can't get the beer I like. That one beer I liked, I can't get it in six weeks. Right. But it didn't stop me from like continuing to come in. Like, what is that? Yeah. So obviously, it seems like Tapped very much fits this craft beer model. Right. That we've been talking about. That's quick and fast, and there's new marketing and there's fun marketing and everything yeah. else. Well, I mean, the uh, again, we are working with a very dynamic model. There is the likelihood that your favorite beer is going to be on Tapped at Tap is very low <laughs> right so yeah, that, that's right. the double-edged sword is yeah. that i have absolutely had somebody walk in and say last week you had so and so it's my favorite beer can i have one of those to which i'll say no because right. that te- keg only lasted three days right but if you love a scotch ale and you had kettle house cold smoke try the dirty bastard try this like it's again there's this huge diversity in what beer can be but stylistically we always try to make sure that we're representing styles that people care about 100 percent. um and while i don't think that it's our responsibility to educate right it's not our job to come when you come into my house it's my not my job to teach you how to be a better beer buyer but at the end of the day it is my job to take care of you so i'm going to transform your preferences into a couple of solid recommendations maybe expand your horizon a little bit maybe find a new favorite beer which I won't have on next time you come in. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. And then I think about me, I head straight to Ryan to tell me about what beer am I going to right. like, you know, because I know, you know what I got last time, what am I going to like this time? Yeah, exactly. And it's a recommendation from Ryan makes beer taste better. 100%. Right? Because at the end of the day, you know, I, the other thing that we talk about in front of house training is that, you know, the phrase, the customer is always right, um, is is meant to instill the idea that, what the customer is always right about their own preferences. The customer is often just like hysterically wrong yeah. about everything else in the world. Yeah. <laughs> but the one thing that they are right about is their own preferences, right? So the customer always knows more than you do about their own preferences. And the customer always knows less than you do about what we have here, right? The server's responsibility is to bridge that gap. Right, to be a liaison, to understand what your preferences are, to have a deep understanding of what we have available. And if I say, I know you're going to love this, yep. it will taste better. Then if you just pick something off the wall going, uh, I, th- I think that sounds like what I like. Right. You know? Which is a, is a feat in itself. I mean, when yeah. you guys have it on the chalkboard, you've got more than, I mean, 30. It's We've got 25 beers, 25. five non-alcoholic beverages right. on tap, um, and then 10 wines on sure. tap. Especially since we focus on getting what's new and what's seasonal, what's limited release. Right. The likelihood that what we have on is on the grocery shelf right now is is pretty hit and miss. You may have never seen what we have available before. And because of that, you need someone who's going to help meet you where you are and say, right. this is what we've got. 100%. 100%, man. Um, can we get back into that? Yeah, absolutely. So want to go back into the, uh, what's it called? Cold Fire. Bourbon Council. Out of Eugene. So the best part about these beers, and I put Dragon's Milk in this vibe, they get better as they get warmer. Absolutely. So it's not you're not doing the crisp thing where it's like you're going to drink the lawnmower thing, which is great in and of yeah. itself. We have a pool when I go home. I'm not looking for this one right. at the pool. So all of those flavors that we were talking about an hour ago have now warmed up. They've opened up. They've breathed a little bit. It's things that were more present early on or less present now. I think that some of the alcoholic heat 
has started to be more present as it becomes warmer. You've got deeper caramel flavors. You've got a little bit more of that chocolate that we were talking about. Right. In some ways, the wood has stepped back a little bit as some of the malt profile has been able to open up. Like it's this is not a different beer than an hour ago, but it's a different experience than an hour definitely. ago. Definitely, feel like the chocolate's yeah. definitely moved forward. Absolutely. Well, and that's why. Uh, so this beer we would serve in a snifter at tapped. Because you get handsy with a snifter in a way that you don't with a regular pint glass. You okay. get more palm on it. Yep. The, right, the heat from your body transfers to the glass more. And so you're more likely to start to warm up that kind of beer. right? Yep. So that you can have, again, a life of experience over right the course of drinking the beer. Right. No, it's very good, dude. Very, very, very good. Um, and, and as we kind of finish out here one of the questions that i wanted to ask for maybe the moscow resident who's never going to step foot in tapped is because they don't want to put another dime in doug wilson's pocket (laughs) (laughs) no we've spent probably a solid time on the podcast. i don't have my phone anymore it fell so i don't know how long we've spent on this podcast but i haven't heard you bring up you delivering your profits into doug wilson's bank account once yeah. Is that part of the marketing? You just don't tell people? Or would you say Doug Wilson doesn't actually gain the profits? <laughs> uh, so, no, Doug. <laughs> it's the most that Doug gets from us is our steak skewers. <laughs> yeah. No. So, I mean, we're, we're an independently operated business. Um, okay. By, you know, so Joel Cohen is the owner. I'm one of the owners. We have a handful of investors. It's, you know, it's kind of like people talking about the country like a Christian nation. My ethics of hospitality and good service yeah. are Christian ethics yep. right? that come from, again, a variety of sources. But my belief that right, history revolves around good eating, right? that redemptive history has flashpoints at the table. Yep. Right? And so we are not a Christian business in the sense that we only employ Christians, we only serve Christians. Like None of that's true. Sure. Right? So, yeah, to be perfectly clear, like, Doug has no ownership in TAP. Christchurch has no ownership in TAP. Um, At the end of the day, do I think that a cold beer and a rotating TAP burger is a ministry? 100%. 100%. I think that we are meeting, right, the carnate in people, right, with hospitality and good food. And I think that... You know, as C.S. Lewis talks about, everybody is moving closer to God or farther away from God, right? And do I? Th- and I think that the loving fellowship that we provide and the quality product that we provide is going to push people in the right direction. Totally. Right. There's no Bible verses printed on the napkins. There's no right again. It's not a Christian business in that sense, and it's not beholden to or has any business link to. There's right? no religious the tests for your servers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> who's your favorite reformer yeah. now? Um, yeah. No, I mean, there's no component to that where we hire believers and non-believers alike. It's not something we talk about in the interview. It is an totally. LLC that buys and sells beer and food. Right. The ethics of the business are Christian men and women who are trying to love their employees, love their guests. Right. And be a consistent presentation of the gospel in every interaction that they have. So like, are we a Christchurch affiliated business? No. Are we people who stand before God with everything that we do and hope that he's pleased with our effort? 100 percent. Yeah. Joke's on them. They get to miss out on all the other stuff we've talked about. So. Well, and that is truly the saddest part to me. That is the saddest part to me, because there are people who I've developed close friendships with despite huge, huge religious and philosophical differences, yeah, right? Because they like beer and I like beer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, and yeah. they, and at best they have taught me grace and I have shown them a, right, a Christian who is hopefully living a consistent lifestyle, whose sanctification is hopefully getting better and better every day. Totally. Um, but yeah, and they, there are people who would never step foot inside a church Right, who don't, you know, who have no affection for my affiliations, right? But who really like me and really like our product. Hundred percent. And the saddest possible thing to me is that there is somebody 
who would miss out on the best beer selection and the best burgers in Moscow. Yeah, man. Because yeah. of where I go to church. Right. Like, and that there's, just there's... seems like so self-damaging. Oh, yeah. Because I promise it doesn't hurt me at all. Right. <laughs> I mean, the only, the closest business affiliation that we have with any of the local churches is that we sometimes sell beer to you. <laughs> Yeah. Right yeah, for we've, for we've money seen you before yeah right yeah, right yeah you've seen me carry a keg in here yeah like it's that's that's it right right it's if anything the money is flowing towards us yeah hundred percent um so yeah it's it is I I fibbed earlier when I said it doesn't hurt me it frustrates me deeply that we have this awesome thing in tapped that there are some people who are unwilling to partake in only because at the end of the day I really am in it for the hospitality. I like that I get to take care of people. Totally. Right? So I did, I was a teacher for a number of years. I did a year of ministerial training under the assumption that I wanted to find a way to take care of people with my life. And then tapped has been one of the best things that's ever happened to me because I get to take care of a thousand people a week. Damn. Like yeah. it's, it's a pretty incredible situation to be in. It's the best job I ever have best job I've ever had. And I've been, and I've had some cool jobs before um, but, you know, Joel, the owner, took a chance on me four and a half years ago where I had very little industry experience, and I've been able to take this business, turn it into something that I'm really incredibly proud of, and in turn, it's been just one of the most fulfilling things that I've ever done. You know, the best way to take, the best thing that you can do with something good is meet it with gratitude. And I have nothing but thanks for the opportunity to serve this community, to take care of these employees, to bless my shareholders. Like it's, um, it's been the hardest four and a half years of my life because it's been a huge, huge amount of work. Yeah. Um, but I would change nothing, and I'm just incredibly grateful that I've been able to do it. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if anybody ever is in Moscow, whether it's at a Grace Agenda or anything else, if you're not a tapped, you have missed out. And uh, make sure to say hi to 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 tie when you see him you'll know you saw him yeah <laughs> and um, uh what's the top thing you recommend tapped if i were to come in today what are you going to tell me to get oof beer and food all right so on we do i'm really bored of the food at tapped <laughs> it's it's phenomenal but i've been eating it for a while and so we do a lot of specials yep. we're doing a um, maple bourbon glazed bacon pop where we took unsliced bacon cut it super thick rendered off the fat, candied it in maple bourbon glaze, and that will become available at noon today. Today is what? February 11th. Yeah, what um, time is it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, any of the specials are typically things okay. that, I've, that I've made that I've come up with, and I'm really – I love ba- bacon. I love bourbon. These bacon bourbon pops are awesome. As far as something to drink yeah. right now, yeah. um, we have on – I mentioned this on our – social media but we have a barrel aged beer from firestone walker it's 14 percent. it's called their hell of a brulee okay so it is their blonde barley wine which is called the hell dorado um they took their blonde barley wine and they barrel aged it in jamaican rum barrels wow so it has this deep caramelized sugar flavor on top of like a robust malt profile from the barley wine okay it tastes like jamaican creme brulee <laughs> It's and again, it's just it's intensely good. It's it's pricey. Again, these beers, these barrel aged beers, pay rent, but it's right, just right. intensely, intensely good. Okay. Um, yeah, it's again the regular menu is always solid. It's our it's our greatest yep. hits album. Yeah. But the the special the specials and the specialty beers that we get to experiment with is is always the first thing that I gravitate to if I'm thinking, all right, I'm at tapped and I need some lunch. Thank you so much, Ty. Thank you.